is Keto. I'm 25 and I'm a single Christian. Growing up in a two-parent background home with both parents, my dad being a pastor, I was able to witness how a relationship work and a relationship should work with God being the center of the relationship. As I grew older, I had to experience life on my own and experience relationships on my own. So I started dating someone and as I was dating them, I knew that they were under a different denomination than I was. But I didn't pay it no mind. I just continued dating this person for like four or five years. And in the back of my head, I already knew about not being equally yoked thing. But I didn't pay it no mind. I just kept it in the back of my head. But somewhere along the line, I knew it wasn't going to work long term because of that. My experience is more so I knew what I wanted, but at the end of the day, I just didn't take it as serious because I was in the world and I wasn't strong in my faith. So in the end, that relationship didn't work. But now as a single Christian currently dating, I'm thankful that I could use God's guidance to help me navigate through the season that I'm currently in because it definitely makes a difference. So some struggles I've faced as a single young man is facing judgment from persons holding me to my past So holding this visual of me from my past not wanting to let that go another struggle i've faced is talking to multiple women at one time and disloyalty to all of the younger persons all men and not alone and i'm thankful that with my connection with god that i'm able to break certain habits and i just want to say that you can do the same my advice for single persons is to try to unlearn traits that lead you further away from God. Like for me, pornography. It wasn't something that I was addicted to, but it did open up doors and expose me to being unloyal to women. So the importance of seeking God while single is so that you don't have to suffer from early heartbreak trauma from making the wrong decisions it's important for you to focus on god and you building your character as a single person so that when you meet the person that god has for you you'll be healed and whole and you could be with them forever this decision i've made carried my single season to the next level and i hope it helps you my name is keto robinson and this is my love story Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, are you ready for a love story? Say it again. Say, neighbor, are you ready for a love story? All right. So let's look into the screen for our main text this morning. It is going to be taken from 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 through 35, and it's the NLT version. And it says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. It says his interests are divided. Somebody say divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. So I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible amen so if I could tag a topic to this text this morning it would be I got the keys someone say I got the keys I got the keys 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 all right so we going home with the keys today amen someone look to your neighbor and be like today I'm going home with the keys so it's going to be the keys to a successful single and dating season amen 
So let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for this word this morning, Father God. As I decrease, Holy Spirit, you increase in me. Father God, let this word permeate in the hearts of your people, Father God, that their lives will be transformed forevermore. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may all be seated. <clears throat> so, before I get started, do we have any single people in the house this morning? All my single people say, hey. all my single people say, hey. Hey. <laughs> all right, do we have any persons dating in the house this morning? Somebody say, hey, if you're dating. Hey. Oh, well, oh, we have a lot of courting persons in the room. Any married people in the house this morning? Say, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> all right, we have, we have a few married folks in the house this morning. Brother Jay is very excited to be married. Let's give it up for the Wilsons in the house, newlyweds. So I believe that God has brought each and every one of us here today to equip us with the keys to being single and dating the right way, which is what, whose way? God's way, right? So, but don't worry, married people, y'all gonna get, y'all gonna get something from this, all right? Believe me, y'all will. So from the beginning of time in Genesis, we see that God is a relational God, and he created us in his image and in his likeness, right? Which means we are relational beings, because if God has created us in his image to be like him, and he is a relational God, that makes us what? Relational beings, amen? Amen. So we were made to be in relationship with our creator, God, but we were also made to be in relationship with his creation. Someone look to your, the side of you or to the front of you and the back of you. That's God's creation, all right? That's God's creation. So you were made to be in relationship with other persons, friendships, dating, married. You were made to be in relationship. Can we all agree? All right. So. When I was studying this, you know, I just was, a thought just came to my mind. And I had to ask God, I was like, God, why are relationships so important to you? Like, I was like, yeah, like, what's the big deal about relationships? You know, getting up in the morning, going to work, talking to people, going to school, talking to people. Like, what's up with this relationship thing? Why is it important? So, I want y'all to note, and if y'all taking notes, I'm going to need y'all to take notes today. So pull out your phone, pull out your, your pen and your paper, because we have plenty of notes to take today. So the first note you need to take is, relationships are the foundation in any story that you could ever tell. Relationships are the foundation of any story, of any testimony that you could ever tell. Can we agree? Someone say amen. All right. So... I was like, you know, God, that's true. It, it is, yeah, no, like, that's true, God. You're right. You're right. And then he had me to look back on my life and look back on the relationships that I was, you know, entangled in, right, even currently. So I was like, boy, the most powerful testimonies really do come from relationships, right? Amen? The most powerful heartbreaks, depression, anxiety, insecurities, most of the times they stem from what? Someone say relationship. All right. So let me tell y'all a little story. I'm going to get real vulnerable with y'all this morning. So I was in a relationship for, with somebody um, for like about five years, right? So when I was thinking back and I was studying, God led me back to um, this relationship. And he was like, Angelique, look at that. Was that not the defining moment that changed your relationship with me forever? Powerful, right? So I was in this relationship for five years, you know, wasn't focused on God, wasn't focused on the things of him. I was just focused on this relationship, right? So that's the first red flag, amen? So how many of you know... <laughs> Listen, and I was ready to ride for this man. I was ready to ride till the wheels fall off for this man. And, you know, but I want you all to know, though, when God isn't in the center, your car is most likely going to run out of gas. It ain't going to get far. It may look like it's going far, like you want a treadmill, but you really ain't going nowhere because it's on E. Amen? Anybody had a relationship that, you know, was on E for a little bit? Can I get an Amen. All right, 
so, you know, we was riding, 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 riding until it ran on E for real, for real. And the thing that God showed me was, you know, where was your focus at the time? Where was your focus at the time of that relationship? Right? I wasn't focused on God. I wasn't focused on his, or focused on his presence. I was focused on the man's presence. I wasn't focused on the word of God. I was focused on texting the word to the man. My focus and his focus weren't aligned we were, because we weren't focused on God and the things of God. We were focused on pleasing ourselves, pleasing each other. That is what we were focusing on. And like I said, it went on E. And, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> let me tell you how funny God is, right? Because, you know, sometimes he has to, like, force you out of a situation that you want to stay in. Because you are stubborn as a mule and you're like, I ain't going. God say, all right, we're going to see the day. We're going to see the day. And the day definitely did come. Yeah, so the man left me. I didn't leave the man. Because, like I said, I was riding for him. I was like, yeah, I'm going to ride for you, baby. Yeah, like, even after, I was like, I still want to ride for you, but you don't want to ride for me? Hurtful, right? So I was like, God, that is so hurtful. Oh, my goodness. Like, so I remember that night so clearly when it happened, you know, I was crying on my knees, begging out to God. And you know what God told me? He said, that's where you should have been in the first place. Because you see, relationships could either bring you great joy or they could bring you great distress, right? So the thing what I'm trying to get to you today is who is in the center? Who are you focused on in this relationship thing? It, during your single season, what are you focusing on? Amen. Because during that season, you know, it brought a time of restoration, thank the Lord, redemption. But it also had to bring me to my knees and I had to heal and I had to go through some things. Do I have any persons in here that had to heal, that had to lay down on their knees and say, God, I need you. Because this relationship, this friendship, man, it hurt me. It hurt me. And you know what? Sometimes you got to admit, I did it myself. <laughs> Nobody did it. I did it myself. <laughs> Amen? So, yeah, so that's just like my little short story to let y'all know, you know, how, how God works and how those relationship things go. So, the enemy doesn't want you to know if you do relationships right, you're doing life God's way. Let's get that out there. The enemy doesn't want you to know if you're doing relationships right. You're actually doing life right. Because what's the foundation? Relationships. Amen. So some people think to themselves, you know, we have introverts. I think that I'm like an introvert extrovert because, you know, I love to speak to people. But then, you know, I like my time by myself. So whatever you are, some people think like, oh, you know, I could do this life thing on myself. I don't need no friends. I don't need nobody. I got on my own. No. God didn't create you to be that way. God didn't create you to function that way, right? He created you as what? A relational human being. And Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, amen? So the most important thing in life is your relationships, the way you handle people and the way you love people. Right? So like I said, relationships can either end up bringing you great joy or great distress. It's really, up, it's really up to you. So honestly, though, and it's the hurtful part, you can't control what the other person in a relationship does. Can you? So I might as well tell you right now, if that man ain't acting right, he's probably not going to act right because you can't control the way that he's acting. Right? But what we can control is how we react, how we speak, how we love. Because the Bible tells us to love our neighbor as ourself. And it should mean then that the way you treat or love others, and take this down, the way you treat or love others is a reflection of how you treat and love yourself. 
So you see me, I don't, I don't care anymore because I got that. I got that word. I don't know if you got that word, but I got that word. And I, like for me, I don't mind if people, you know, don't compliment me or people don't come up to me with like the greatest attitude. I like they have nothing to say because it's like, okay, it's a reflection of how you feel about yourself. So I'm going to need you to take that up with you. It's not me. Amen. So we're not talking about relationships anymore. We're talking about you. Someone look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, wake up because you need to look at you first. So let's talk about what we're going to be covering today because I can't wait to get in it. The three S's we are going to be covering today. Somebody say it with me. Single, Single. seeking, Seeking. and sex. sex. Why every, no, and sex. sex. Say it with your chest, and sex. Amen. Oh, we'll be getting all cringy already. Don't worry. So let's go into the first etch, which, which is single. The definition, let's read the definition. It says, so if you didn't shout that you were single <laughs> because you dating, unfortunately, in the heavenlies, you are considered as single. Not until you say, I do, amen. All right, so a lot of us think, so that the solution for our loneliness, our, our singles, because we're talking to the singles, the solution for our loneliness, we think it's marriage. But it's not. So I want you to take down this point. Singleness is the foundation of all human relationships. Because before you can be in a relationship with somebody, you have to be single. Two persons, it takes two persons to do a relationship, right? So singleness is the foundation of all human relationships. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 9. So it says, So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. So isn't that something? The Bible actually discourages us from getting married. Ain't that, ain't that crazy? And all we wish for in our whole entire life is just to go down that aisle so bad. And the Bible discourages us from getting married. So FYI, you need to stop pressuring persons into marriage and any parents out there that you know asking their children um so you find a boyfriend yet um you ready to get married yet um stop it stop it (laughs) can i get an amen like like we talk about it like it's a bad thing to be single listen listen to me when i tell you it is better to be balled up mad and home alone rather than living in hell on earth with somebody for the rest of your life it is better to be home mad at god lord why i can't find you ain't sending this man yet tend to be living and saying i do to a monster so let's get into the first key for singleness the first key to singleness is going to be singleness is a gift from God. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's a gift. And I'm single, so it's a gift. (laughs) It's a gift to be single, all right? So tell them, don't worry about it. So (laughs) we need to be running to singleness and not from it. Singleness in the Bible is considered a gift. It's not a curse. Like just because you're lonely right now, it doesn't mean that you're cursed like God punishing you. Actually, God is doing you a favor. (laughs) God is doing you a favor. So let's not run from singleness, but let's run to it if you're in a season of singleness. Because if you don't know, and take this down, especially my single persons, the more single you become, the more safer your marriage will be. I can run that back real quick. I said, the more single you become, the more safer your marriage will be. Some of us ain't, some of us still ain't catch that. So the more safer you are in God, the more secure you are in God, the more you know who God has called you to be, the more steady your marriage will be because you don't have to depend on somebody to be your joy. You don't have to depend on somebody to be your happiness. Because
because I know where my joy comes from and it doesn't come from a man. It doesn't come from a woman. Because some of us go into marriage and we're, you know, happy. We don't really know who we are. And then we expect this man to be doing the most. What God's supposed to be doing. What God is supposed to give you. So we think something is wrong with us if we're single for years and years and years. But Paul speaks to it as a gift in Corinthians. And Jesus in Matthew 19 verses 11 says, it's good for those to whom it has been given. Someone say singleness, singleness. is a gift. I need y'all to get that through your head. So if you're single right now, it's a gift that you should cherish for as long as you're in it. This is what the Bible is telling us to do. And if it is your desire to get married and you're burning up with lust, it will be God's gift as well if you ever received it, all right? So it's a gift to not be married and then it's also a gift to be married, amen? So the second key is you need to focus on the advantages of singleness. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 27 through 28 says, are you pledged to a woman? Meaning, are you married? It says, do not seek to be released. Do not seek looking for ways to be divorced. Are you free from such a commitment? Are you single? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face what this says. But those who marry will face many troubles. Why y'all ain't saying that? It says many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. So marriage brings... So <laughs> So marriage brings blessings. Listen closely. <laughs> if you can't say in my married people, you know, just sit in, sit in tight. Y'all be coming, all right? Right now, that's for my singles. All right? So marriage can bring blessings, but there are also difficulties. So you think living life single is hard, baby. Wait until you step into marriage. You think, oh, yes, yeah, it's going to be so easy. I'm going to be relieved because I have someone else helping me. No, <laughs> it's going to be way harder. All right. So I wish more married people would speak up and tell us, like, you know, it's not a walk in the park. Like, oh, yeah, we just come to church and we go all together and we just so happy. Like, no, baby, it's not a walk in the park. Like, we have to discuss things every single day. When you're single, you could just go about your business, live your life. Don't ask me any questions. Like, I'm good, right? So when you say, I do, you are choosing. Let me tell you what you're choosing to do. You are choosing to die to yourself every single day. So it's already hard enough. Some of us, it's very hard for us to die to our flesh, like God says, every single day for God. So when you're saying, I do, then you're technically dying twice every single day. Once to your flesh and once for your marriage. Are you ready to die twice? <laughs> because with marriage, you consider more than one person when making decisions about everything, even down to what you want to eat everything and then you know the children come along and your focus and time is being stretched so thin so married people can I get an amen amen amen, amen. so the next key we're gonna go into is stop focusing on marriage and start focusing on who on who say it again we who we focusing on and who yourself amen so 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 through 34, it says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life, and an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are what? Divided. So you might be thinking, all right, so what should I be doing as a single person then? The answer is right there. What should you be doing as a single person? Spending his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. 
So you should be spending time, if you're single right now, you should be spending time doing the Lord's work and thinking about what are your thoughts supposed to be about that man or what? No, you're supposed to be thinking about how to please God. So if you're not doing this in your single season, you're not doing your single season correctly. Correctly. So that's why you feel empty all the time, needy all the time. Like you have to be talking to somebody all the time. And God is saying, hey, I'm right here. Talk to me. I'm right here. Talk to me. And I will guide the way and I'll show you the one I have for you. It's the moment when I stopped focusing on the man and I started focusing on myself and who God has called me to be was the moment when God was like, okay, okay. Amen. So stop focusing on the wrong things. So it's easier for single persons to focus on God because what? They have fewer distractions in life. Ask the married people. Can the married people say amen again? (laughs) It's a lot of distractions that come with being married. They are undivided in their devotion to the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Marriage necessitates devotion, all right, to the spouse as well as to God. So now you have to share your devotion to your husband as well as to God. So you have to find time to balance it. So your marriage will only be as good as your singleness was. Your marriage will only be as good as your singleness was or is. So I heard somebody put it like this. If you knew all you knew about you, would you marry you? And I'm not talking about, you know, the good parts. Oh, yeah, I could cook for him. I could clean for him. How you talk to the man? Do you love yourself? Are you a nag? Let's be honest. So if you know everything there was to know about you, would you marry you? I'm going to let y'all sit with that and carry that home, all right? Because you're asking someone to live the rest of their life with that. So while you're single, focus on finding who you are in God and stop worrying about the next relationship, the next person, who you could talk to next. Because I realize, at least for females, it's so hard for us to even be alone because we don't know who God has called us to be. How many of you know it's a powerful thing to know who God has called you to be? Somebody give me a clap for that, a praise for that. It is a powerful thing. See, y'all ain't clapping because some of y'all don't know who God has called you to be. But when you step into that, baby, chains break. When you step into that, baby, God is placing you in rooms that nobody can take you out. When you step into that, baby, God is going to say, okay, I'm going to bless you. When you step into who God has called you to be, and when you find that out, don't worry, you'll be more excited when you find it out yourself, all right? (laughs) Don't worry, I can pray for you, baby. (laughs) So I ain't worried about anybody anymore, being honest. Like, if the relationship works out, fine. If it doesn't, thank God. Because sometimes you got to say, thank God, that it didn't work out. Thank God. You begging our man to come back, baby. I delivered you from heartbreak. I delivered you from an STD. I delivered you from early pregnancy. (laughs) Oh, my God. So you need to let the person know, like, God loves me, baby, and I love me. That's how you need to step out of your single season, knowing that God loves me, and I love me. All right? Someone say period. All right. So single, stop settling and start focusing on God and the work you need to do to be the best you in this season. So let's go into the second S. The second S is what? Seeking. And what does seeking mean? So, you know, if you, you're doing your single season well, you know, you're in your single season and, you know, God, God gives you the opportunity to go ahead and, you know, date. He presents you with somebody. What are you looking for? Someone look to your neighbor. Say neighbor. What are you looking, not the married people, <laughs> y'all then, y'all then tell. The singles look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, what you looking for? Do you know what you're looking for? And I'm not talking about the superficial list that you have. Oh, he have to be six foot, black chocolate, light skin like a banana. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking <laughs> deeper. All right, someone say deeper. Hmm. 
So Mark 10, I mean, some people, some men is want to figure a woman with bare belly. Oh, like, come on. You want, you want a woman that, anyway. <laughs> so, so let's talk deeper. Someone say deeper. All right. So Mark 10 verses 9, everyone should know this one. It says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Everybody should know that scripture. So let's read it again. It says, therefore, what God, someone say what God has joined together, let no one separate. Someone say what God. All right, because that's very important. Because it says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So that means that there's a distinction. Which means God doesn't join everybody together. Singles, take note. And if you're dating, take notes in bold. Because you might be saying I do soon. (laughs) My married people just keep saying amen. 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 So God gives us free will to make our own decisions. Can God choose your salvation for you? No, right? And that's eternal. So what makes you think that he is going to choose your made for you? Which is temporary. So we tend to put our own things together, right? Ignore God, ignore all the red flags and ask him to what? Bless it. When we go down the aisle, bless it. So we ignore all the red flags. God showing, I mean, it right in the front of your face. And you're like, no, God, I want this man. I need this man. I'm lonely. Like, <laughs> you're not helping your sister out over here. So you take it down the aisle. You pretty it up in a tuxedo. You pretty it up in a white dress. <laughs> and you don't really know what's behind that. <clears throat> so... What should you be looking for? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. What should you be looking for? I'm going to help, help you out today. So let's start with the men. Women pay attention. All right. What should women be looking for in a man? Don't put, don't put it up yet. Don't put it up yet. Hold on. So in Genesis, in Genesis, right? Because when we look into like, you know, what, a man, what we should be looking for in a man or what we should be looking for in a woman, the perfect thing to look to is what? Going back to the foundation, back to the beginning, which is in Genesis, right? So it was God's design for man and woman. We could see it in um, the garden, right? So God designed a man, Adam, a woman, Eve, the first man and the first woman, right? So that's who we need to take the blueprint and the keys from. So let's look at The first man God made. So, it said that Eve met Adam in the garden of, where did he meet him? Where did she meet him? In Eden, right? The garden, someone say Eden. So, in Hebrew, Eden means spot. Spot means, someone say presence. So then, Where should you meet the man that you're thinking about marrying? Smart. We have a smart glass. Wow. So, woman, you should meet your man in the presence of God. And I'm not talking about, you know, a church-going man, because, you know, I heard that they could be kind of, they're the voice, but... You're looking for, you know, it's good, you know, when they go to church or whatever, but you're not looking for them in the church. What you need to be looking for, if you find them in the church, can you pray for me? Can you pray for yourself? What is your purpose? Do you know the vision God has placed you with? Or are you just chasing after money? That's all you know, money run. Yeah, that's what I got, money. And I said, no sense, no brains, just money. Don't know how to pray. Lord, thank you for the world. So see, thank you for the food we eat. Amen, babe. Let's eat. Let's eat. That's all you know how to do. You can't pray for me. You can't protect me. You can't cover me. Nothing. Because you ain't in the presence of God. You don't have a relationship with God. And I'm not saying that the man has to be, you know, perfect, but at least have some type of foundation. To show me. And 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 it's important when you date and you call in to look out for these things. 
to see if, okay, he see like, okay, yeah, you really serious about it. Like, I need to get in the present. Not just for you, but I need to learn how to do it myself. I'm not saying you go to him and be like, you need to come in the presence. Your life should be a testimony to him then while you're dating. Amen? So that's the first thing. So, <laughs> wait, before, before we go, you know, I talked about this with somebody earlier this week. And, you know, you're saying like women in particular, and maybe some men, we love to, you know, drag the man in the presence. We find him from the deepest part of the the, the eight outside of the garden eating, and we dragging him. Come to church. Come to church. Pray. You do your devotions yet? You pray yet? No. Someone say no. All right, so, so now we can move on. Let's go to the second one. Genesis 2, verses 15. Don't put it up yet says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it so then what that means your man should be what I didn't say it the Bible said it so the second thing God did after the presence he gave man work God gave man work before woman man to pay attention because you shouldn't be looking for no woman if you don't work and I'm not saying like it's the Bible and I'm only the messenger you should not you should not be looking for a woman if you're not working because God gave man work before woman someone say work before woman all right so don't expect him to do anything if you met him doing nothing. So let's go to the next point. Let's go to the next point. The next point is you need a man. You can put it up on the screen. Can they cultivate you? Because God gave Adam a command to what? Cultivate. Cultivate. Which, which means it <laughs> The Bible's so good, y'all. The man is supposed to bring out the best of you and everything around you. But for women, we want to bring the best out of him. It's the opposite way, baby. You're doing it the opposite way. So, man, God is not going to give you a perfect woman. The, the one that you're dreaming about in your dreams, it's not real. Wake up. Tap your brother and say, wake up. Even if you're married, wake up. <laughs> because the woman you're looking for does not exist. Your job is to take the raw material that God gave you that you married and you're supposed to what? Someone say cultivate. Cultivate, cultivate it. Bring out the best in her. If you've been married for 10 years and you don't like the product that you have, then whose fault is it? You don't like the wife you married? Who fault? So like, if she gaining a little weight and stuff, you're supposed to be like, okay, baby, I go pay for your gym membership. I'll go with you in the gym once a week. Let's do this together. You're supposed to cultivate her to be the best her she could be. If the man isn't willing to do that, and that, that, that is a man that is not for you, Amen. Just want to be feeding you and, you know, getting you out. of Like, no, it's not healthy for you, babes. All right. So the next thing is the man needs to be a what? A leader and protector. Ephesians 5 verses 25, it says, husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, y'all have a heavy, 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 heavy mantle to carry. But God has given you the strength to do so. You just need to be connected to him, all right? So I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm saying this to build you up. This is what God, this is who God has called you to be. This is what God has placed on the inside of you. You just need to tap into it. Someone say tap into it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if we look at how Christ loved the church then, he, he is a leader for sure. He is a protector, right? He protects us. He leads us. He provides for us. This is what a man is supposed to be doing. Right? So you think God built y'all like that for no reason? We could all been built big. 
if, if there was like no reason behind it. You're supposed to be a leader and protector. We're supposed to feel safe with you. So the last thing you need to know is, is he in, does he know, and is he living out God's word? So God spoke to who? Adam, when he was in the garden, he told Adam to not touch the tree. He didn't tell Eve anything. He didn't speak to Eve. There was no communication. God spoke to Adam to not touch the tree. So God left his job then was to what? Teach his wife the word of God and to obey it. So maybe he did tell her something, but you know, the obedience part wasn't really there yet for Adam, but you know. <clears throat> so <laughs> you are to, men are to really teach the word of God to us. But in these days, the woman know more scripture than the man. So men, you're built to carry the burden, right? So <laughs> Genesis 2 verses 18, it says, it's not good though. For the man, someone say, for the man to be alone. So we take that as, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. Any man. Y'all missed it. What did God say? It is not good for the man. Which man was he talking about? Adam, right? He was talking about Adam. What, what did Adam come with? Adam was in his presence. Adam was working. Adam was cultivating. Adam was a leader and a protector. Adam was new and lived out God's word. That is the man who he's talking about. So it's not good for that man to be alone. Any other man. Any other man should be what? Someone say amen. Come on, this is good. I mean, I need y'all to get this. <laughs> All right, so man, I'm gonna ease up off of y'all. Let's go on to the woman then. All my ladies say, hey. Hey. All right, so let's get to y'all. Man, what you looking for? Right, because you're supposed to be the one really and truly looking. I only looking to see what you're doing after you then find me, right? So number one thing, the woman should be, we all know it, a helper. We don't like that word. Everyone just gone quiet. They say, oh my goodness. Oh, that one again. I'd be trying to put that in the back of my head. No, that's the first one. Because in Genesis 2 verses 18, it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So men, don't marry a woman who comes to tell you how to run your life. Woman, you don't marry a man and dictate how he is supposed to live. A helper is not the head. I don't care what you think. Someone say a helper is not the head. So a wise woman helps her husband achieve. And if he might be a little lost sometimes, you got to say, baby, Keep asking him questions. That's how you get the best out of men. Baby, what your vision is? Where you want to be in the next five to ten years? What do you want for your life? You know, baby, tell me we can make it happen. Let me know. I know you got it in you, baby. Help him out. Someone say, help your brother out. You, and if you're married, help him out because you're stuck with him now. Help him out. <laughs> so, But no, for real, no, most women belittle their husbands. You so lazy. You just like my daddy. I can't stand you because you just like my daddy. You worse than my daddy. You even stand and look like my daddy. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, for real. But even if your husband may not be the ideal man, you need to help him become that. Don't give up on him. <laughs> It's deep, I know. So, man, if woman then is the helper, then you should know that she is coming with intelligence. She is coming with wisdom. She is coming with power. She's coming with anointing because we were created to help you. We are coming through loaded with equipment to help. But you got to be doing something for us to help you with. So make sure before you get married that you have a vision for yourself. 
because Pastor Miles Monroe said anything with two heads is a monster. One vision, one household, one union, one marriage. Amen. And like, even if you don't know how to read the scripture like that, when y'all doing devotions and go, baby, you know, come on, you could do it. Help him. Someone say, help him. Help him. Okay. <laughs> so the next thing you need to do then, um, the next thing you need to be looking for is a multiplier because women, what do we do? We multiply. God created us to multiply. If you give a woman a house, what we make it? A home. If you give us one sperm, what we give you back? Maybe triplets, twins quadruplets I mean this body is amazing it can do many 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 wonders amen and if you give her frustration what will she give you be careful what you're giving her to multiply be careful what you're giving her to multiply but even if you're dating you need to watch then what she is multiplying on her own is she multiplying confusion gossip What is she multiplying? Things that you need to look out for, right? So the next thing is a woman is to be then and encourage us. Someone say, encourage him. him. So women, like I said, you need to cheer him on instead of destroying him with your words. Now I know me. Words cut deep. And I'm going to cut you. I can cut you deep. But thank God for deliverance. And all my ladies out there, ain't it hard to not say some things? Because sometimes that mouth, I mean, you ready. He just come home. You, you fixing your mouth. You trying hard not to. All you want to do is say something. Beam you up inside to say something now. <laughs> if you can't say amen, say ouch. No, but for real though. So we wonder why some men don't like to stay at home. So we sitting down on the phone with our girlfriend, model. Why, why you think he never want to be home with me? And I, I, I cook for him, and I, I clean this house, and he never want to be home with me. <laughs> because you're tearing him down, you're belittling him. He has no respect. Let me tell you a thing about men. We need love as women, but men need respect. Someone say respect. Come on, give me some prayers for that. Men need respect man I come and be oh I'm helping you oh man oh my man is like man I tell ya someone said it I'll be the one to say it don't worry but no they are talked down to in the home so they don't want to be there they come home five minutes go go on the road don't see them until they waiting until you go sleep you blowing up their phone they watching you blow up their phone Okay, she stopped. I know I could go home now. Go home. She's sleeping. Yeah, I good. <laughs> We're good to go. Next day to work. Same thing over and over and over again. And that's where the doors are open up for adultery and all type of other things. So be careful. The next thing, though, is you need a Proverbs 31 woman. I mean, God blessed y'all with a whole Proverbs 31 woman. To, to look after. So I'm going to let you read that in your own time, a Proverbs 31 woman. But one thing I could say in the scripture, it says she doesn't cause her husband to go after spoiled. So if you didn't know, women are natural born receivers. We receive things, right? That's the way God made us. So we were made to receive love. We were made to receive gifts, all these things. But a virtuous woman might want something, but will not pressure her man to go out and get it. Someone say Tangzi. For my persons online watching, Tangzi is a Bahamian word, I think. It comes from the Bahamas. And it basically means a little bit of a gold digger. You know, you like things. Material, exactly, material gold. All right? So, <laughs> why everyone so quiet? Some of us in there like things, eh? <laughs> everyone, everyone all quiet. What happened? No, but for real, we could see in society today that some women make their husbands go out and kill themselves just to get a Tory Burch bag. Or a Tory Burch shoe. See, I don't even own one, so I don't know what they make. So a Tory Burch shoe. Watch out if you're dating. You want me to take you out to lunch, breakfast, dinner, 
on a $200 paycheck a week? You want me to spend my money taking you out on trips when I barely make minimum wage? Is that a woman that's trying to build up the person or tear that person down? All right, so someone say don't do that. We're not doing that, all right? So let me let y'all in on the next little tip before we move on. In dating, if he or she doesn't change to get you, he or she won't change to keep you. All right? If he or she doesn't change to get you, what you think I do is going to do? Nothing but multiply the mass. All right, so let's move on to the third S. And this is the last one. What does it say? All right, so we're going to talk about sex today, all right? So what does sex mean? Any, anybody want to tell me what sex? No, I'm just joking, just joking. So <laughs> I know that culture is telling us today that sex is meant for pleasure, that sex is meant to feel good. Sex has become so casual in our culture today, but sex has so much such an intrinsic and powerful meaning. Pay close attention. Because let's look at what God says about sex. Genesis 2, verses 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be, someone say one flesh. So we can see in the word that sex isn't casual at all. But it creates a one flesh union. Sex is meant for two to become what? One. Someone say one. So God made sex so serious and so powerful that he intended for it to be the glue to bond one man and one woman together for life. Someone say one. All right. So God created sex and anything that God creates then is good. Right? So that means someone say sex is good. Someone say a lot of sex is good. All right. So, but the thing is, anything that's good, the devil is going to try to pervert it and sell it to the world that since it's good, you should go ahead and do it when you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want, however many times you want. But what culture in the world doesn't know is that the enemy from the beginning of time in the garden wanted to make Eve feel like God was withholding something from her. Because sometimes we could feel like, why would you make this thing that, you know, I desire and I can't have? You're withholding something from me. Like, why? Why do we have to wait to have sex? But like, what's the big deal? Sometimes you say, you know, I want it, and, you know, I want it right now. <laughs> like, I'm feeling hot and bothered, and, you know, I need it right now. But God, who is such a good God, gave us the key to sex in the right context. Anybody thankful for that? Someone say amen. amen. You might not like it, but you could get it today. So God designed sex to be with one. Someone say one. One woman. One man. For one flesh one lifetime that was God's design for sex we get that but you know it's so so hard to wait and it's so hard to only have one newsflash though it's only hard because of where your focus is it takes us back to our singleness and how we're doing singleness are you focusing on God's word or are you focusing on your boo when you know when y'all link up what's gonna happen you inviting them over to Netflix and chilling. No Netflix turn on yet. All you have is brrr, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. Movie over. <laughs> right? So <laughs> are you focusing on what's pleasing to God or are you focused on pleasing your boyfriend or your girlfriend or the person you're talking to? That'll take your virginity, take your scent, and then break your heart in the process. So you left with bamboos or basically. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18, right? What does it say about sex um, outside of marriage? Someone say, flee. flee. Say it louder, flee. flee. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So let's look at what flee means. 
Flee means to run away from a place or a situation of danger. So God is telling you to flee from sex before marriage. What does flee mean? To run away from a place or a situation of danger. So it's basically telling us that sex outside of marriage is what? Dangerous. So sex outside of the context God intended it for it to be hurts us more than helps us. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Because you're sinning against your own body because you are joining together with this person who isn't your lifelong partner. And you're saying to them, I'm giving you full control of me. How many persons have full control of you? When you have sex, you're giving your whole self away to somebody. Your personality, your identity, your mind, your will, your emotions are connected to this person for life. Someone say for life. So you might be asking, like, okay, if God knew it was going to be so hard, why did he give us this desire in the first place, right? Some of us don't wonder, like, why, God, just take the desire away from me. So you ever heard of the saying, don't awaken love before it's time? Because we live in a sinful world, though. The enemy is going to do everything he can to try and expose you to these desires way before you even know what to do with them. So parents, listen closely. Because you have to be careful what your children are watching, what they're listening to, and who they're connected to. Because there is a devil out there, baby, and he's waiting. He's waiting to take their innocence away at any time. So you see, God gives us these desires at the right time. In, in a perfect world, but we live in a fallen world, right? Because we could see before, you know, Eve bit the apple, that God gave him this desire, Adam this desire, at the right time. Amen? Okay, let me help y'all out. So before God brought this desire to Adam, he was quite fine with him alone in the garden. He wasn't even thinking about woman, right? Woman didn't exist to him. He was quite fine, him and the animals, you know, in the garden doing his business because Adam wasn't exposed or opened up to anything else. Amen? So my question to you is, what are you exposing yourself to? Or what have you been exposed to? Serious question. What are you currently still exposing yourself to? Can I get an amen? So you can't say, oh, I struggle with sex before marriage, but every day when you go home, you're watching these lovemaking movies, and you know you can't have sex. You on Instagram watching girls twerk and you know you can. <laughs> Why would you do that to yourself? <clears throat> so some of us wonder why it's so hard to be single though after opening up yourself and exposing yourself to sex with no commitment or marriage. It's because the desire was there. You fed into the desire by having sex and now that person has control of your soul. And what is your soul? Your mind and emotions and now you're stuck chasing a man that don't even love you and you're stuck chasing a woman that stay doing you dirty and you're stuck chasing a man that talks to you like dirt or barely even be talking to you at all because some of us be talking to ourselves hey babe you there hey hi hey and he's like totally disconnected you begin settling for anything because sex outside of marriage betrays the, the real love that we all really want. Because we're settling for the hurt and the pain that God never even wanted us to experience in the first place. So a sexual union is meant to be a unifying agent in the context of marriage. Because sex inside of marriage is unification. That means that then sex outside of marriage causes what? division. Sex inside of marriage, you know, you get children. Sex outside of marriage is teenage unwanted pregnancy that can result in abortions and heartache. Sex inside of marriage is oneness. Sex outside of marriage leaves pieces of you everywhere. You can't even go somewhere without thinking about that person. You can't even sleep at night because you're thinking about that person. It leaves pieces of you 
everywhere when God wanted it to be one. Someone say one. So sex outside of marriage, really, it has you all tied up. Your soul is all tied up. And what is that called? A soul tie. So let's look into what a soul tie is. And I'm almost done. The definition is what? An intense, let's read it, an intense connection that binds people together physically, mentally, and spiritually. You might think of it as a physical cord or tie that connects two people, which can be legal or illegal. So how many of you know that all soul ties ain't bad? Some of y'all maybe didn't know that. But yeah, so we have legal soul ties and then we also have illegal soul ties. So a godly soul tie is legal and pure. That's when you do friendships and you're doing relationships the right way. It's great to be connected and having your soul tied with someone that has the same purpose and the same vision that you have. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> but an ungodly or illegal soul tie that can be established through having multiple sexual partners that should have never been made ultimately brings a person into bondage or robs or controls a person's soul that brings harm to them as a result of the bond. Listen closely. The ungodly soul ties are the devil's tactic in spiritual warfare for believers to establish unhealthy, toxic, unproductive, ungodly, negative, and life-altering relationships, connections, and commitments with people outside of God's will for you. Because how many of you know the devil only needs one wrong relationship to rob your purpose and rob you of your destiny? One wrong relationship. It only takes one. Someone say it only takes one. So the soul as we know it consists of the mind the will and the emotions that's your entire being your mind is all messed up all tied up your will is all tied up with this person's will your emotions all tied up you're not even yourself anymore so unhealthy and toxic relationships of the past and present can negatively play a part in how a person thinks how they act and how they feel that's why when a person moves or ends a relationship years later you're still what thinking about that person I can't break free from that person emotionally so so let's demonstrate it real quick Demi come up for me please brother Edwin come up for me please so Demi I want you to stand right here in the middle right here and then I want brother Edwin to stand right there all right um <clears throat> Nelly come here please Come here, please, Nelly. Um, Kiana, come here, please. <laughs> All right. All right, yeah, we're going to need a couple of people. All right, so <clears throat> let's say Brother Edwin, he had a soul tie with Nelly. Hold, hold on to him. Yeah, right there. All right. Kiana, Kiana come on the side, please. Hold Brother Edwin right here. All right. So, <clears throat> I'll take it out. Boo, come. Brother Jay, come, please. Actually, um, y'all just hold hands ar around each other. Hold on, me. You come here, Brother Eddie. And Nelly, you hold hands with her. Hold hands with her. And then, yeah, Brother Eddie, you come in the middle now. Brother Jay, come around, please. Who else I could get to come? Adron, come, please. <laughs> Sister Fiona, come please. Adron, come. Come right in the front now. So what I need y'all to do is, Sister Fiona, hold their hands. I need y'all to create a circle around Edwin. Right now. And make a circle around Demi. Oh, just hold hands. All right, so Demi has slept with three persons, right? Outside of marriage. Edwin has slept with three women outside of marriage, right? So let's say Demi is now, you know, in tune with God. And, you know, he, he brings him. I mean, he brings her brother Eddie. Right? So let's say, you know, they begin dating. And they decide, you know, I do. I do at the, at the marriage date. Without breaking their soul ties. Brother Eddie, try to reach over to Demi. 
y'all prevent him from doing so. <laughs> Demi try to reach over to Brother Eddie. So what you're seeing here is two persons that God actually wants to join together, but they can't even be joined properly because there's so many ties in the way. So some of us, when we go down the aisle, this is what we look like. A bunch of persons attached to your life that isn't supposed to be there in the safe in the first place. So Demi, go, go for it away. Go for it away for me. You all walk with her. All right, try try to go up the aisle to, to, to Edwin. Try. Try to walk. You can't, you can't even go to the altar properly. You can't even think straight because you're connected. Brother Eddie, try to go to Demi again. You all tied up. <laughs> I swear. So this is a no, but for real, I need y'all to remember this picture because this is how we look. Whether you have three sexual partners, four sexual partners, five, we all tied up. If you don't break the tie, someone say break the tie before it breaks you. Because this marriage then, it'll never work because we can't really have real intimacy. We can't really find our purpose together. We can't really be and live out our vision together. Amen? Because this is what we look like. This is what we look like. This is how we live our lives. Imagine if people could see the amount of bodies you have or the amount of um, soul ties you're connected with. And you're just walking around in a whole circle. I mean, 10 people circling you all day. You're looking on Instagram. You see that one person. You're reminiscing about how... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you all was in the car together and, you know, having a good time. This is how you look. Living like this every single day is toxic. It's not good. It robs you. You can't think straight. You can't act like how you used to act. You take on the personalities of all these different people. So one day you're battling. You're battling with, with Nelly. You're battling with Kiara. You're battling with Fiona. You're trying to figure out why your attitudes think now. Why you can't trust no man now? Because you all tied up. Y'all give them a round of applause for that demonstration. I just wanted y'all to see how we look if we don't break the soul tie. Amen? So I want y'all to know though that 80% of self-identified Christians have sex before marriage. 80%. So how much is 80% of this room? <laughs> like, two people? So, no, don't look around. Don't look around because they gone. <laughs> you say they gone. They gone, baby. 80% of Christians have sex before marriage compared to 88% of the general population. Just as bad as the world. And God has given us the keys to do it differently. So let's look at how to break soul ties, right? Let's get, let's get, yeah, we almost done. After this, we done. So a soul tie is imperative and necessary step to take before you can move forward with your life. We see that, right? That's what you need to get from the demonstration. So it's necessary for you to break these soul ties before you can move forward, even if you're not getting married, before you could actually move forward with your life, you need to break the soul ties. So people are stuck in relationships because they are bound by the contract or terms of agreement that were established because sex is a blood covenant. So every time you, you lay down with somebody, it's a blood covenant. And that ain't nothing like to deal with. When I realized this, it changed my entire life. You're creating a blood covenant. In the Old Testament, blood covenant sealed. Sealed the covenant. Blood sealed the covenant. So you're sealing something with this person. <laughs> so how many of you say it's time to rip up and tear up and shred up the soul ties? Can I get an amen? Some of us, you know, in marriage and we still have soul ties and we don't know it. So all of us should be saying amen. amen. 
Let's give a praise to God for the keys before I tell you them. All right? And the good thing is that it doesn't have to be a mutual agreement. If you want to break a soul tie, you could do it on your own. You don't need to come in agreement with the person. All right? So number one is you need to acknowledge that a soul tie exists. You have to be honest with, your, with yourself that you are ready to move on and be free from the connection. Some of us don't want to be free. We enjoy being tied up. We enjoy making blood covenants with everybody. It's the truth. You're not willing to acknowledge. And the first step is acknowledging. So, for example, if a person has an addiction, they must first, try, they must first confess by acknowledging the problem. That is the first step. James 5, verses 16 in, instructs us to, therefore confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. The word confess means to declare, to proclaim, to say out loud. Acknowledging is basically confessing. Someone look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. are you ready to confess? So let's go on to number two. You need to choose to end the relationship. I'm not going to sit up here and say end the relationship. I don't know what you got going on. God gives you free will and who am I to say stop, right? But you have to choose. It has to be your decision. Nobody else could choose for you. You have to choose to end the relationship. And I'm not talking about no closure conversation. Because anybody have had a closure conversation before? Oh, I just coming over and getting some closure. Soul tie up all over again. Your soul tie up all over. No closure was had there. Anybody who had a closure moment before I could testify, someone say amen. amen. <laughs> so it's just not good. So you can end the relationship if you see that it's clearly not the man or woman God has for you. So if you feel like it is and you're, you guys are still like, you know, deciding to have sex or whatever, no, y'all need to stop. Because then eventually it'll run out of ease. So even if that is what somebody who somebody who God has created you to be with, that is going to eventually run out on E. And things are going to open up and start happening. That was never meant to happen because of your decision to do sex outside of marriage. So be careful. But if that is the person you feel like, make the decision to stop. And it has to be an equal decision, not just you. Because, baby, I'm going to tell you, every time, it, every time it'll fail, if it's just you saying you don't want to have sex and that person saying, mm, I ain't really into that, then it's not going to work. All right? But I'm not saying that you have to go and cut off your baby mommy, your baby daddy, your ex-wife, your ex-husband. That's not get too extreme. But you must be wise in your action so that all doors do not be reopened. Soul ties can be loosed. And just as they are loosed, they can be tied right back up again. So you have to be careful to close that door. Amen. So the third thing is you need to remove any and all physical objects that link you to that person. So that nice gift he or she bought you, throw it away. <laughs> no, like that, that nice little Tory bird slip on, that little MK bag, baby. <laughs> throw it away. Those pictures, stop looking at them. Delete it. This is vital in breaking the soul tie because keep in mind, these objects are symbols of the bond. And it must be removed from real life. So you carrying around this person, you're thinking, oh, I'm not even thinking about him anymore. The devil, real crafty, all he needs is a foothold, baby. All he needs is a foothold. Amen? So like even with me, like, you know, I remember I had to, you know, get rid of some things that this person bought me. And I was like wa walking around, even when I was dating somebody new, I was like, okay, you know, I still have on this ring. I still have this little bag, this cute bag. I was like, you know, this is it's really bothering me until I realized how tied up your soul could be even to those two things. So I remember I was in um, Fort Lauderdale and I was like, no, I, I cannot do it. I it came to my senses and I took that ring and I threw it in the lake and I took that designer bag, my one designer bag. <laughs> my one designer bag. And I threw it away. I didn't even pawn it. Someone told me I should have pawned it and I was like, shoot. 
I shut up and then I was like, no, 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 no. I didn't need no money from it. I want it all gone. Thank you very much. All right. So that's something that freed me personally, like so much. So I'm telling you. All right. So the fourth thing is choose to forgive. Forgiveness. We think that, that there's something so massive and so big about spiritual warfare and fighting the enemy and and you know it 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 is a big deal but forgiveness is a powerful gift and can be considered as the most powerful spiritual warfare weapon simple as that forgiveness because the enemy doesn't want people to forgive because forgiveness means that you will be set free So the devil wants you to remain the victim in the situation and unwilling to forgive the person that you have the soul tie with. That's not what God wants. So unforgiveness keeps the soul tie active and you need forgiveness in order to release it. Someone say release it. Release it. Forgive the person. Forgive the person. Thank God for that person. Thank God for the next season that the other person is going into. Thank God. Be joyful and happy about it. Don't be bitter and sad. Someone say release it. So I want y'all to know, do you see how much time and energy and effort it takes to actually break a soul tie? But it only takes about two minutes to make one. The enemy doesn't want you to know that in that two minutes, it's going to take you, it could take some persons a lifetime to break soul ties. Man, it only took two minutes to make. So with everyone standing, the bottom line today is the key to successful singleness, seeking, and sex is to do it whose way? Is to do it whose way? He gives us the keys. He gives his children the blueprint, but we just have to follow it. So God never wanted us to experience singleness alone, seeking alone, and sex alone. He gave us the keys and all we have to do is use it. And it'll open the door to healing. It'll open the door to restoration. And it'll open the door to breakthrough. And it'll open the door to a whole you. Baby, when you come into Christ, the pieces that you left everywhere, once that soul tie is breaking, you are whole. Amen. Can I get some praise? that God is able to restore that God is able to make you whole again with all eyes closed I know some of us may have messed up I know some of us may have had soul ties or have soul ties and you're looking for restoration today you want a better way today you want to experience healing and freedom today So if you want to rededicate your life or if you want to make the commitment to God that God, I want to do it your way. I don't want to do this life alone. I don't want to experience these things alone. God, I need your healing. God, I need your restoration. God, I need redemption for my life because I realize that what the plan of the enemy is and I don't want that for me online if this is you you could go ahead and raise your hand in the chat and our service host there will pray for you but if there's anybody in the room right now with all eyes closed if that's your cry today if you want to give your heart to the Lord today or rededicate your life because you see the importance of having these keys that come from him go ahead and raise your hand for me in this moment with all eyes closed could raise your hand I see that hand I see that hand God wants to heal you today. God wants to deliver you today. God wants to set you free from the ties of bondage today. So Lord, with those hands lifted, God, I just want to thank you for these lives, God. 
and the persons that want to give their life to you. God, I thank you for healing right now, God. I thank you for delivering them right now, Father God. I thank you for breaking and dismantling every soul tie right now in the name of Jesus, God. They're equipped with the keys, Father God. So give them the strength to live it out and walk it out daily. God, we know that this walk is hard, Father God, but you are faithful and you are able to do what it is in your word that you said you will do. God, so we thank you. And with everybody repeating after me, Father God, we thank you, God. We love you, Father. And we just want to say that there is nothing holding us back from you and your love. So because I know that, I will walk in you today. I will walk in your faith I will walk in your love. I will walk in your healing. I will walk in your light for my life. So God, I give my heart to you today. I give my mind to you today. I give my will to you today. And my emotions, Father. My soul is yours. God, I thank you for this new life in you. I'm going to follow the keys. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Give your God some praise. Wow, 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 what a word, what a word. Sister Angie, please don't don't go right don't go right away. Um come come back to the front, please. Um I know we, we, we did this before and uh, we mentioned this before. But for those of you who don't know, those of you online who don't know. Sister Angie grew up in Relevant Kingdom Center. Our mission and vision here at Relevant Kingdom Center is to make disciples, to develop leaders, and to change lives. And to hear Sister Angie teach today. Didn't she teach today? Teach today about singleness, sex, and seeking. Wow, what a word is all I could say because there were some things that Sister Angie talked about and it only could have been the anointing of God himself to reveal it to her that there were some things that I didn't even think about or saw it that way before. And so I learned a lot. And so before Sister Angelique um, leave our presence for, for a moment, I want us all to stretch our hands towards her today and pray in our hearts for Sister Angie because after a powerful word like that, we know the kingdom of the enemy is very, very upset. And so we're going to come against every backlash, every plan of the enemy, that the seed that was planted today, that it falls on good ground and takes root in our hearts today. So that today when we leave this place, we will definitely not be the same as we came. And so God, our Father, we thank you right now for Sister Angie. We thank you for the anointing that made the difference in her life. We thank you for the word that you put in her. We thank you now, Heavenly Father, that everything that was said and done today 
that you will receive the honor, the glory, the thanks, and the praise. We pray now, and we give you thanks for the yokes that were broken. We thank you for all those that were in bondage that are now free. We thank you, Father God, because we know that there is nothing too hard for you. And no matter how far we are from you, that your love that we talked about today is able to reach us. And so we give you honor and glory again. We give you thanks and praise. In no other name about, uh, than the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our soon coming King. And all those in agreement would say, Amen. Love story. Right now we're gonna get into we're gonna go into another aspect of our service. That we all can play a part. Right now, I ask the first touch team to prepare to receive our gifts. And there are three there are ways to give. And here at Relevant Kingdom Center, we want to thank you for helping us to make disciples, to develop leaders, and to change lives. Your generosity definitely makes the difference. Uh, you can use the Cash App, just dollar sign, RKC Florida. Online, you can visit our website at relevantkingdomcenter.com. Or you can text, uh, SMS text to text dollar amount to 84321. Or you can just even mail in at 23456 Junction Avenue, Port Charlotte, Florida, uh, 33980. If you have your gifts in your hand, you can, let us pray for it. Father, we thank you for the gifts that we are about to sow. We thank you for what it is about to do. We ask you now to multiply it. And we pray that it will go forth to do what it is you've called it to do. We give you honor, glory, thanks, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Have some announcements for you uh, this week 